Okay, so shall we just start? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm just trying to say. Okay, well, uh, it's it's uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have with us Shai, uh, who is finding himself in Europe, happily for us. Uh, and um, he is going to tell us about his work on the upper critical dimension of, of the three-state POTS model. Please, Shai. All right, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, this is based on ongoing with Ming Su and Jay Han Chin. So I emphasize that it's ongoing. So um, also I should, I originally started working on this project seven years ago, um, originally with Igor Klebanov and Sylvia Fufu, and I've had many useful conversations over the years. So it's been a very long ongoing project. Um, okay, so uh, let's begin by motivating why we want this three-state POTS model. Um, so first of all, it's relevant to reality. So the critical three-state POTS model describes phase transitions in nature in two dimensions. So for instance, um, restricting helium atoms on graphite so, coverage show a second order phase transition with critical exponents that match the exactly known value. And this is something which was shown many years ago in various experiments. Um, so, so it actually describes things people care about. Um, in 3D, the POTS lattice model describes cubic ferro magnets with three easy axes, uh, and I give an example. But in this case, experiments suggest that it shows a fourth order phase transition. So i.e. Uh, you do not expect to be critical in this case, at least based on sure. Um, so, so that's the motivation from the experimental uh, perspective. Um, from a more theoretical perspective, the POTS model, as I will describe, is in some sense the simplest quantum field theory after the icing model, in the sense that it has very few relevant operators and the global symmetry is just S3. So if you're just interested in general facts about quantum field, this is like a very uh, nice model to study. Um, lastly, and most relevant to this talk, the critical and tricritical three-state POTS models, which I will describe in more detail, are believed to demonstrate the merger and annihilation scenario for critical points as a function of either Q or space-time D near the value Q equals three. So I will, in the next slide, explain what I mean by this merger and annihilation scenario for critical points. Okay, so this is the main thing we're going to talk about. So let's give a brief. Let's consider two families of unitary uh, CFTs parameterized by some parameter S with the same global symmetry and the same number of relevant operators, except one of the C of T has one extra relevant singlet under the global symmetry. So as we would change its parameter S, the C of T data of the two conformal field theories would get closer and closer until a certain critical value of S where the two C of T's would become completely identical. And then they would go off to the complex plane and no longer be unitary. Um, so this uh, was, described you know, roughly 10 years ago in this paper. But of course, this is actually a very old idea. So I, I don't even know who the first, but I imagine it goes back many decades. Um, and in particular, a very sharp sign of this merger and annihilation scenario is that the extra relevant singlet operator becomes exactly marginal, which you know, basically has to happen because one theory was low marginal, one theory was above marginal, and then as it meets, it then becomes marginal. Um, so that's the general story of merger and annihilation scenario. So this is one way that a CFT disappears. Um, so specifically for the three, for the critical and tricritical two-state POTS model, so they have the same S2 global symmetry, but the tricritical POTS model has an extra relevant operator when Q equals three, which makes it a good um, uh, possibility for this merger and annihilation scenario. So, uh, so one example in which this is shown is that in two dimensions, um, the critical and tricritical Q state POTS model, we can let this parameter S be Q. So let Q be the parameter for which when you change it, the two CFTs will then merge and collide and go off to the complex plane. So in particular, as Q goes to the critical value of Q equals four, the theories merge, which was shown many, many years ago by these people as well as other authors. Um, and then they go off to the complex plane, which was explored in a recent paper by Slava and Kalebri. Um, so, so this is kind of one context uh, for these POTS models where you can see the merger annihilation happening. Because in 2D, you can compute everything, everything is completely known, and you just see that these theories become the same and go off into the complex plane. Um, but uh, th that's where we're letting S be Q. But there's another possibility where we can let the S be the space-time dimension D, where we fix Q to equal three. And then we see if the, if the critical and tricritical theories merge as D changes. Um, so let's talk about the critical value of Q as a function of D in D bigger than Q. So there's a result going back many decades, which I will briefly review. 
So first of all, if D is four or bigger, then it was proven that the average value of Q such that you have a conformal field theory is two. So this is shown in this class of paper by Aharoni and Pitt in 81. I should note in this case, there's no merger and annihilation going on. There's, a, there's just like the simple fact that for T equals two, the POTS model is just the icing model. And it's well known that the icing model becomes a free theory at T equals four. Um, and so this is a somewhat more uh, trivial situation. Um, so, so now going below D equals four. So in 3D, there are lattice Monte Carlo studies which suggest if the largest value of Q such that you have a C of T is around 2.45. So here I'm quoting one lattice Monte Carlo study, but of course there have been many, many over the years. This is just, I guess, one of the more prominent ones. Um, and so this combined with the experimental fact from my first suggests that there probably isn't a CFT in three dimensions for the Q equals three POTS model. Of course, there's the Q equals two POTS model, so that's the IC model, but, but not for the so, so now that we go below three, D, that's where it gets into. So what this critical value of put in a uh, lattice Monte Carlo observation of the POTS model by this is the same De Boer in high energy. I think he did this as a master student. Then when D equals 2.5, the critical value of Q is around two. Uh, hi, Shai. Uh, uh, there, there's some problem with the sound. Like I, I don't hear one half of what you're saying. There maybe there's some problem with the with the batteries. Um, do you hear better when my mask is off? The problem is that I, I, I hear you when when uh, it's not the problem of the mask. It's I think it's the problem of the of the sound transmission somehow. Um, you can try you could try to keep it closer a bit to the mask and then see what's happening. Okay, so when I hold it like this, is it better? For the moment, yeah. Okay, great. So I, I can just hold it like this. Um, so, um, in case you didn't hear the previous last few sentences, I'm just describing. Um, the largest value of Q such that you have a CFT in various space time dimensions D. Um, so I just described uh, a certain result claiming that in D equals 2.5, the value of Q critical is 2.68. Um, there's also some epsilon expansion results. So in particular, you use the fact that Q equals two is the icing model, which is marginal in D equals four, and you do kind of like a double epsilon expansion around D equals four and, and Q equals two. Um, so this was done in this original paper by Aharoni and Pitt. And they use this to argue that um, when D is four minus epsilon, the critical value of Q would be two plus epsilon. So, so this estimate you know, does seem to work when epsilon is zero, because then you get the expected value that for the icing model, it becomes um, marginal in 4D. And you also seem to get the expected answer for epsilon equals one, um, or sorry, for epsilon equals two. Um, there's also been some more updated work uh, by Newman, Riedel, and Muto, which I think disagreed with the previous results, um, but I, I don't want to go into those details. Um, finally, uh, there was an RG analysis, um, which claimed, which only was able to look at like specific fractional values because uh, basically they can only look at the, at like two to the A equals D and then A can be an integer. And so the only fractional value they were able to look at between two and three was 2.32. And in, for that fractional value, they claimed that the upper, that Q critical was 2.85. So, so they would basically predict that for Q equals three, the largest value of D such that you have a CFT must be below 2.32. So, so they would claim that it's very close to two is the, the upper critical dimension. So I should note that while all these methods have their advantages, they're all, they're all like using very, very different methods. I mean, like, you know, so some of these are using generalizations of the POTS model where it's not so clear how it's related to the conventional POTS model. You know, some of them are using, you know, perturbative analyses, which there's no reason to expect maybe why they would be true for this non-perturbative theory. So like there hasn't been any analysis so far which directly applied to the POTS model and like directly was a conformal field theory and was completely non perturbed um, And so that's what this talk is gonna hopefully fill in that gap. So in particular, in this talk, we're gonna use the conformal bootstrap to find the upper critical dimension, which we're gonna argue is around 2.5 for Q equals three. And we're gonna show that it happens very explicitly from the merger and annihilation of the critical and tricritical conformal field theories. Um, so, so that's the goal. Um, my thing, okay, it's still on. Okay, so let me give a brief outline. So we're gonna start by defining the Q-state POTS model in any space-time D, um, as well as the critical and tricritical fixed points of that lattice model. We're then gonna review some exact solutions in two dimensions um, 
for various Q. Um, then we're going to move on to new material. So in 2D, we're going to use the conformal bootstrap to find kinks that correspond to the exact solutions of the three straight critical and tricritical POTS CFPs. And then using the exact same bootstrap setup, which can naturally be defined in any dimension D, we're going to increase D and find that the critical and tricritical kinks merge and disappear around D equals 2.5. Okay, so let's start with the review of the lattice definition of the POTS model, which is valid for any space-time dimension D and any value Q. So um, this should hopefully be familiar to all the stat mech people in the audience. Uh, you can see that has nothing to do with conformal field theory. So, so let's consider D-dimensional square lattice of random spins with the Hamiltonian, where these spins go from one to Q, and it's just the simple Hamiltonian. So you just have nearest neighbor interaction. This was the thing originally studied by POTS back in 1952. So you can note that this exact uh, partition function has SQ global symmetry, you know, just by changing all these spins. Um, so we can now see what happens to this lattice model as we change the inverse temperature beta. So at large beta, i.e. small temperature, there's an ordered phase with Q degenerate ground states with SQ broken and one spin value preferred. Whereas at small beta, i.e. large temperature, we have a disorder phase with one ground state which preserves the SQ symmetry. The, the usual story. I mean, you know, for instance, this is how it works the icing model in Q equals two. So, in particular, because we have these two phases, that means we can tune this inverse temperature to a certain critical value such that we get a phase transition. And that's what's called the critical POTS model. Um, now, we can consider a generalization of this lattice model, which is called the dilute lattice model. So, in this generalization, now we let. And then you can tune beta to get the same critical POTS model that we just described, but now there's a possibility of tuning both beta as well as the chemical potential of these vacancies to get the tricritical POTS model. So this is called tricritical because now we have to tune two parameters to get to the fixed one. Um, okay, great. And, and critical uh, POTS models, it's just critical and tricritical. Okay, so now let's give some explicit examples. So we can start with the simplest example, which is when Q the icing model. Um, so in particular, the critical and tricritical POTS models with Q equals two are the critical and tricritical icing models with the usual Z2 global symmetry. So in D equals two, the tricritical theory happens to have an enhanced superconformal algebra, uh, but I should note that this is something peculiar to D equals two. So for D bigger than two, the tricritical model uh, does not have supersymmetry and it has nothing to do with N equals one super. So that's uh, just a point of fact to keep in mind. Um, the critical icing model has two relevant operators, uh, one which is Z2 even, one which is Z2 odd, whereas the tricritical uh, icing model has four relevant operators, two Z2 even, two Z2 odd. Um, in two dimensions, the critical and tricritical theories are the lowest two unitary diagonal minimal models. Um, and so these are basically the simplest CFTs you, know, you can possibly write down, which are interacting. Um, this is just a certain labeling scheme, and their central charge is half for the critical icing model and seven tenths for the tricritical icing model. And so the, the important fact is just that these are completely solvable theories. So we know everything about the 2D icing and tricritical icing models. In fact, there is a general family of diagonal minimal models, which I label by MP plus 1P, which are described by Lagrangian with just this interaction of phi squared to the P minus one. And so based on this, full landau Ginsberg uh, description, you immediately know that the upper critical dimension is simply when this phi squared to the P minus one operator becomes marginal. So in particular, the upper critical dimension is two P minus two over P minus two. So as an example, um, uh, for the critical icing model, the critical value of D is four. And for the tricritical icing model, the critical value is three. And in this case, this has nothing to do with merger and annihilation. So these theories are not disappearing because the critical icing somehow combined with the tricritical icing. Instead, it's just the trivial fact that a Lagrangian, which becomes marginal in a certain value of D. Um, another way you could see that you shouldn't have expected merger and annihilation is that the one theory had two relevant operators, but the other theory had four relevant operators. And like, it's probably only reasonable to expect merger and annihilation for two theories that differ by a single relevant operator. Because otherwise, it's very unlikely that as you change some parameter, you know, both relevant operators would change. You know, that, that seems very unnatural. Uh, uh, Krasha, can I, can I make a comment at this point? 
because okay you are, you are contrasting this to uh, different uh, kinds of disappearance but in fact uh, one uh, one could also say that they are a bit similar in both cases the theory disappears because it collides with some other theory and you just have to look which theories are they around to collide with. There is a free theory. You can collide either sure. with the free theory yeah. or with something trivial. So yeah, okay, okay. in both cases, an operator becomes marginal. So in a sense, it's not so different. It's just to collide. Sure. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think it's a great point. Um, yeah. The only difference is that it's a somewhat more trivial and merger and annihilation because they're not annihilating with each other. They're annihilating with these silly free theories um, instead. Uh, but yeah, but that, thanks for that comment. Um, okay. So I, actually, I mean, are you going to comment? Uh, so, since since there seems to be some discontinuity between q equal two case and q equal three case, like yeah. for q equal two, you collide with free theory. Yeah. And for q equal three, there is merge annihilation. Yeah. So, should we think that there is some like intermediate value of q where there is a? I will comment on that near the end of the talk. Okay. Thanks. So, so stay tuned. Um, okay. So, before we move on to the hero of the story, which is q equals three, let's briefly talk about other values where q does not equal three. So for Q equals four, um, the tricritical and critical plots are the exact same unitary C of T in two dimensions. Uh, in particular, it's the free scalar compactified on S1 mod Z2 at radius uh, one over square root of two. And this has three marginal operators. Um, so as noted by Slavin in his recent paper, you can think of one of these marginal operators as the one expected from the merger and annihilation scenario, because one of the marginal operators is a singlet under S4, whereas the other ones are charged. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of the, the biggest value of Q you possibly care about. Above Q equals four, these are all just first order phase transitions. So us conformal people don't care about that. Um, another interesting value is when you take the limit as Q goes to one. So if you were to consider the conventional, the original definition of the POTS model, this would seem a little bit trivial. But there's a different definition of the lattice POTS model called the random cluster definition. And when you take Q goes to one in this definition, um, then um, you actually describe something interesting called Percolation. Um, and so this was shown in the original paper by Furtuin and Castellan. And I should note this was also recently studied by some of the authors here. Uh, but this won't be so relevant uh, to this talk. Um, similarly, you can use this random cluster definition of the POTS model, which works for any real value of Q, to in fact take the limit as Q goes to zero. And so in that case, you also get something interesting, which in fact is not even a CFT, it's something called spanning trees, which was also studied in the original paper. Uh, but th th these are just some fun facts. This isn't relevant uh, to this talk. How can you say this is not a CFT? I mean, come on. Yeah, it's a free Laplacian. Well, okay, it's an extremely trivial one. I guess I should say that. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so, um, so so now let's move on uh, to the hero right, of the story. Two, two people here don't agree that it's trivial, but okay, it's, it's, it's an extremely a... non-trivial, but nonetheless irrelevant to this talk. <laughs> okay, um, so 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 now let's move on to the Q equals three POTS conformal field theory. Uh, and let's give some uh, general definition. So we define the three state pots uh, C of T in general D as a conformal field theory with S3 global symmetry and a certain number of relevant operators. So, so that's gonna be our general definition. So we're not gonna be defining it from the lattice model, even though in principle you could, and so we're gonna give kind of the general axiomatic definition, which we like to use in the bootstrap community. So in particular, this, uh, this theory is S3 symmetry and uh, there's three possible representations of S3 symmetry. So we have a singlet called zero. We have the sine representation, which I'm gonna call zero minus. This is odd under the Z2 subgroup. And then we have a charged representation, which is charged under the Z3 subgroup of S3, also under the Z2 subgroup. So the critical POTS model is defined as having two relevant charged operators, which we call sigma and sigma prime, and one relevant singlet, which we're gonna call epsilon. The tricritical POTS model, in contrast, has two relevant charged operators, sigma and sigma prime, and two relevant singlets. So they only differ by the tricritical having an extra relevant sign. And so this is what makes it so interesting. So unlike the Q equals two POTS model, i.e. the icing model, the Q equals three POTS model, the critical and tricritical CFTs differ by just a single relevant operator. And so this, this is what makes them such a good candidate for a non-trivial merger and annihilation scenario. Um, because all we need to do is for this single, you know, epsilon prime operator to become marginal and then merger and annihilation can occur. So that's what's kind of special about uh, Q equals three. So, I'm sorry, I missed this point, uh, Shai. Can you repeat? Yeah. So you're saying for the easing, this would not be possible because there's some well, other discrepancy. Well, I mean, it's not impossible. It just seems less likely because in the icing model, the critical and tricritical differ by two relevant operators. 
And so if they were to somehow merge and collide, somehow both of these but relevant the operators part. would have to like both become marginal at the exact same time, which but, to me just seems only like- only one of these two is, is singlet, right? Um, one is a singlet, one is charged, yeah. Okay, okay. But, but there's still two. I mean, just, it's like, it's not impossible, it's just less likely. So okay. like, um, so the Q equals three is a, a better candidate. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so let's talk about the exactly solved uh, cases in two dimensions. So the critical and tricritical pots in C2D are minimal models, in particular with C equals four fifths and C equals six, six sevenths, uh, with non-diagonal modular partition functions. So recall that previously when we were discussing these minimal models, we said that all the diagonal minimal models can be described by this very simple landau ginzburg lagrangian which immediately predicts their upper critical dimension and the whole story is a bit trivial. Um, so what makes the POTS model not trivial is that we have this non-diagonal modular partition function, in which case there isn't really a good Lagrangian description. Now, I mean, I understand people over the years have used various Lagrangian descriptions, but I don't think any of them are as powerful as the diagonal case. Um, so uh, of course you could always look at the diagonal case, but then it's not the POTS model. Instead, it's just some multi-critical generalization of the IC model. So in particular, it doesn't have S3 symmetry. It only has Z2 symmetry. And these theories, you know, just become marginal in some known fractional dimension. Um, so some other interesting things about the critical model in 2D is that the critical POTS has its Vero symmetry enhanced to W3 symmetry in two dimensions, um, which is a larger, um, you know, space-time group. Um, and in particular, it's the lowest central charge member of a family of unitary CFTs with W3 symmetry. So, so there's a whole bunch of these unitary like W3 minimal models and critical pots is just the lowest one. Um, the the tricritical pots also have its zero source symmetry enhanced. In this case, it's to W2 comma five symmetry in two dimensions. And um, this is a bit weirder than, than the W3 case because this is in fact the only unitary CFT with W2 five symmetry. And this is because W2 five symmetry is an exceptional algebra. And so it only exists for specific values of C unlike W3, which is a more generic algebra and which can exist in principle for any value of C. This is something which was shown by Buchnecht in 88. Um, on the other hand, so even though there's no family of W5 you know, minimal unitary CFTs, instead there's a different family. So the tricritical POTS is the lowest central charge member of a family of unitary CFTs with SC, S3 symmetry and which are built from parafermions. So parafermions are just, um, I guess like operators in two dimensions, which have spin, which isn't half or integer. So like usually it's some fractional. So I think in, in particular, in this case, I think they have like spin four thirds or something. So I should note that these aren't actual like well-defined primary operators. They're just like used to build up theories. So this is kind of analogous to in the 2D icing model, you know, as Slava pointed out to me yesterday, the fermion is not an actual operator in the theory. It's not a primary. Instead, it's just a useful mathematical device in order to describe the actual primaries in the theory. And so it's the same thing with these parafermion theories. So like these parafermions are just useful mathematical objects in order to describe these theories. And so, um, so, the, and so, so this family of theories was uh, also pointed out by Zamolodzikov and Fateyev uh, a year after their uh, critical pot paper. Yeah? No, no. Uh, well, um, look, they can be used in either context, but uh, they are more relevant to the tricritical pot. Uh, hi, Shai, if there are questions from the audience, could you be so kind to repeat them because uh, it's not uh, heard by us? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so he was just asking, like, you know, in what case are paraforming on relevant? And I was saying that um, they're more relevant to the tricritical plots um, based on this paper by Zamal Um Although I think they also come up in the regular critical plots as well. Um, uh, uh, ah, um, so have there been any questions which I missed? Uh, yeah, if there's questions, people should just say them. It, it's easier than, than writing them. Uh, so, Slava, are there any questions I should address? I can't really read that, it's too small. Yeah. No, for the moment, uh, everything's fine. Okay, okay, great, uh, thanks. Yeah, but yeah, but feel free just to interrupt me with word, um, spoken word. Um, okay, so, so now let's review the primaries in the 2D critical POTS model. So the Virasoa primaries with integer spin um, are given by a subset of this minimal model that appear in the non-diagonal torus partition function. And I'm going to label these by their scaling dimension delta, their spin j, and then their representation r. And, and I'm using delta in the usual like general dimension meaning. So I'm not talking about like some like chiral h, h bar, I'm talking about the actual scaling dimension. Um, similar for this one. 
So here's the complete list of primary operators. So we have these two relevant charged operators, sigma and sigma prime. Um, as you see, the dimensions are both below two, both scalars. Then we have um, the single relevant singlet epsilon of dimension 0.8. Then we have the next lowest singlet, which is not relevant because it's dimension 2.8. And then there's an even higher uh, singlet, which is dimension six. Additionally, there is a spin one primary um, as well as a spin three primary. Now I should note that the possibility of having spinning primaries, of course, can only happen when you have a non-diagonal model. Because for a diagonal model, you, there, everything is a scalar because H always equals H bar. And so, so we only have this non-trivial possibility because there's non-diagonal. So the fact that you have this uh, spin three dimension three operator means it's a conserved current. And this is why you have W3 symmetry uh, be because of the existence of this conserved operator. Um, um, now, eventually when we talk about the bootstrap, we are gonna be talking about quasi primaries because that's the, that's the idea that naturally generalizes to higher space time dimensions. Um, so these are quasi primaries under the global conformal group. And of course there are infinite such quasi primaries, not just this finite list. So for instance, you have the stress tensor and all these quasi primaries can be derived from these primaries as usual, just by acting with the Virasoro generators. Um, alternatively, an easy way of counting them is just to expand the torus partition function and quasi primary characters. Um, okay, so, so that's the list for the 2D critical pots. For the 2D tricritical pots, um, there's a bigger list of Virasoro primaries. So again, we just take this M76 minimal model, um, and then we demand that it have this non-diagonal torus partition function, which is modular invariant. And these are the following operators you find. So as, um, just like the pots model, we have two relevant charged operators, sigma and sigma prime. Um, now there's an additional charged operator, which is irrelevant because it's above 2D. Um, now we have two relevant singlets, epsilon and epsilon prime, as well as a whole bunch of irrelevant singlets. Um, so that's kind of the important difference. The fact that the second, this epsilon prime is now uh, below 2D. Um, we now have various spinning operators of spin one, of spin three. And then the, the more interesting one is spin five, which has exactly dimension five. And so this is again, a conserved current. And this is what gives you the W25 algebra. Um, so now this, this can make clear what I mean by this notation W25. This is just an algebra, which is generated by a spin two conserved current and a spin five conserved current, where spin two is the stress tensor, spin five is this W. So like, it's a, kind of funny, the notation, because like, why do you call it W25? Why don't you just call it W5? Well, I didn't make it up, but that's what people call it. Um, I, I think one motivation is that when people say W5, they're talking about a chiral algebra, which has uh, generators of every integer up to and including five. So they would also include you know, three and four. And those are somehow more generic. Uh, so just having five is weirder, which is why you call it W25. Okay, so these are completely solvable theories. We know everything about them in two dimensions. And so that means we know not just their scaling dimensions, but their OP coefficients as well. Um, so but when I say these are solvable, I mean solvable in principle. I don't think people have actually necessarily computed all these quantities. So there's a paper by Fuchs and Clement 89, which said how to compute OP coefficients in non-diagonal uh, minimal models. Um, and this algorithm was carried out for the critical pots model in this paper in 95. Um, also, there was a more recent paper by people in the audience from a different perspective. And so they computed all the OP coefficients. And um, here is an example of one of them. So if you take you know, the OP coefficient sigma sigma bar with epsilon, you get this number. So I'm just showing this result just to show what these answers look like. So they all involve gammas of fractional numbers. Um, Try critical pots. I don't think this algorithm has actually been carried out as far as I know. Although um, there's a lot of pots experts in the audience, so correct me if I'm wrong. So a few OP coefficients in the tri critical pots were computed in this original paper by Zamalajikov. Um, and there's also a paper by uh, two physicists from Algeria, but I think their answers are wrong. Um, but aside from those two papers, I don't actually know if anyone's computed the tricritical OP coefficient. So I think this would be a great project for students. Um, okay. Um, now, just one more fact to say about OP coefficients is that in both the critical and tricritical pot CFPs, um, there are many OP coefficients that would be allowed by S3 symmetry uh, in general, D bigger than two, but are zero in 2D because of the enhanced Vera Soro or W algebra constraints. So like a classic example is the fact lambda epsilon 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 is zero. So this, this is something which is true, I think for pretty much every minimal model. And, but this is something which is only true in 2D. So for instance, if you look at the IC model in 3D, then lambda epsilon 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 is non-true. It just happens to be zero in 2D. 
And so this is why you have to be careful that a lot of intuition in 2D does not apply to higher D because you have these enhanced symmetry. Um, so that's why we're not going to use any facts but OP coefficients for the rest of this talk. Um, okay, um, let me just give a few more details about these W3 minimal models, which, we, which will be relevant to the bootstrap. So this is just following Zamologikov's classic paper. So recall, I mentioned that the critical part with C equals four fifths is the lowest member of a family of W3 minimal models parameterized by P with the following central charge, where P starts from four. So when P equals four, this is the critical part. Um, so this is a completely solvable theory. And so the scaling dimensions are all known and they're parameterized by four numbers, N1, N2, M1, M2. And these, these Ns and Ms, they correspond to Dinkin labels of the SL3 cross SL3 subgroup of the W3 cross W3 bar uh, space-time symmetry. Because remember the Virasoro was enhanced to W3. So these scaling dimensions are completely known. Um, so an, an important fact relevant to us is that the number of relevant operators grows with P. Despite that, the fusion rules set the OP of sigma cross sigma to only include sigma and sigma prime, as long as P equals one, two mod three. Uh, so in particular, like these are the exact values of sigma and sigma prime, which are defined as the lowest two relevant uh, singlets, uh, so lowest two relevant charged operators. Um, and they are related by this very simple linear relationship. So delta sigma prime is five over two delta sigma plus one. I should note that this only works for P equals one and two mod three, because for P equals zero mod three, these operators become singlets instead of being a Z3 charge. Um, so this is kind of like a curious fact is that even though the number of relevant operators is totally different as P changes, if you look at a specific OPE, it will look as like there are only two relevant operators. And that's gonna be important uh, for the bootstrap. And this is, the, this is the exact same story in the IC model. So like also, or not the IC model, but it's the exact same story for like Z2 minimal models. So for Z2 minimal models, also parameterized by P, as P increases, the number of relevant operators you know, grows, but in certain specific channels, it will always just look like there's the same number of relevant operators as the IC model. Um, okay, so, so that, that concludes the review of all these exact results in 2D. So, so any questions before I go from old material to new material? Hi, I'm Ben Weston. Maybe one naive question. I saw these W3 minimal models. Uh, that's what people actually call multi-critical POTS model. So like take P equals five, that would be the three critical POTS model, but I guess that's not the same three critical POTS model that you're looking at. Sorry, well, what, what, what's the question? So if you go back to the previous slide, you have this yeah. minimal models of this W3 algebra. So yeah. P equals four is uh, POTS. Yeah. But I thought like P equals five was three critical pots, but I guess that's- No, 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 that's not, not true. So, yeah, yeah. So like the, the P equals five has nothing to do with the tricritical pots. Okay, thanks. Because okay. in fact, the tricritical pots does not have W3 symmetry. So it can't possibly be labeled by this time. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, so now let's describe the general strategy of how we're going to bootstrap these pots CFTs. So for all D equals two or bigger, we consider the global conformal group, SOD plus one comma one in Euclidean space. So that means in particular in 2D, we consider quasi-primaries in D bigger than two. I mean, you can call them quasi-primaries, but they're the only game in town. So this is a way that we're able to describe all the dimensions we care about on the same footing. So we don't care about Virasoro symmetry uh, for the bootstrap study I'm gonna do. Um, as usual uh, in the bootstrap, consider quasi-primaries of relevant scalar operators. So that means, our options are sigma, sigma prime, epsilon, epsilon prime. But remember the sigmas are charged under Z3 and the epsilons are uncharged under C3. And I should note that epsilon prime is only relevant for the tricrit. So let's start with the absolute simplest correlator that is sensitive to the S3 global symmetry, namely the four point function of sigma. So we don't wanna look at the four point function of epsilon because that's not relevant to the S3 symmetry. And then there would be no way from this general bootstrap perspective is even knowing that we're looking at the, at the POTS model because we might as well be looking at the IC model. So more abstractly, um, we consider correlators of a scalar in the one representation of which sigma is defined to be the lowest dimension. So, because remember the bootstrap always takes a very, the bootstrap a priori has no idea that we're looking at the POTS model. All it knows is that we're gonna be looking at some CFT with S3 symmetry, and we're gonna be looking at the lowest dimension operator, which is charged under that S3. And I should note, I will talk about mixed correlators later. For now, I'm just looking at this simplest correlator. 
Okay, so let's give some facts about the sigma four point function. So we can expand the sigma correlator in blocks for each representation that appears in one cross one. So in particular, all three representations appear the singlet, the sine representation zero minus, and the charge representation one. So that means we take the four point function and we expand it in blocks in the usual way. So here, these G delta J are conformal blocks labeled by the scaling dimension and spin. U and V are the conformal cross ratios. And then they are multiplied by the OP coefficient squared because as usual, we took the OP twice. And these OP coefficients are labeled by dimension, spin, as well as these three possible representations. And also note that as usual in the bootstrap, the scaling dimension of the external operator you know, enters into this four point function in terms of these overall factors in front. So uh, I should note, that the allowed spins are different depending on which representation. So for the singlet and the charged, you have even spins because they're in the symmetric product. Well, for the sine representation, you have odd spins because they're in the anti-symmetric product. Sh shy? But, yeah. Uh, shouldn't there be some like uh, invariant tensors that you are not, uh, that are implicit in this equation? Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. So there should be some tensors that are implicit in this equation. I didn't write them down for simplicity, but yeah, yeah. But like, I guess you could say these OP coefficients find with some tensor stuff. Um, sorry, yeah, I guess I, yeah, I should be a bit more careful about that. Um, so now um, you can now do one three crossing um, as usual. So as Alessandro reviewed, as many other people have reviewed over the last couple of weeks, um, in the end of the day, you're gonna get three families of crossing equations. Um, so I should note that these crossing equations you get are the exact same crossing equations you would get by looking at the four point function of the fundamental of O2. So this is something which Alessandro described in great detail, I think in his uh, review lectures. So hopefully this should be familiar. So you should recall that when you look at the ON bootstrap of the fundamental, then you have three representations, the singlet, the anti-symmetric and the symmetric traceless. And um, you can identify these three representations that appear with the three representations that appear for S3. So in particular, both the fundamental and the symmetric representation you, have, you can identify with the charge because they're exactly the same. The singlet is the singlet, and the anti-symmetric is the sine representation. So that means from the abstract um, uh, symmetry perspective, the only difference between the crossing equations for us with S3 symmetry and the crossing equations for the O2 case is that the external operator now appears in its own OPE because now we just have one, whereas in the O2 model, we would have the fundamental and the symmetric traces, which would have been different. I should note that also the critical O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point does not exist in two dimensions. So you wouldn't even have to worry about being polluted by um, you know, other islands or kinks or whatever. Um, but but I, this should assure you that even above two dimensions, there is still a difference between the O2 model and, and our bootstrap because of this fact that uh, F and T are now the same. Um, finally, I should note that I'm just talking about Q equals three, but you could similarly look at the four point function of the charged operator for general Q. Um, and in that case, there are four crossing equations, which was worked out by Wang and Sue in uh, 2017. And so the, there's only two special values of Q, which have fewer than four equations. So one of them is Q equals three, which is what I just described. The other case is Q equals two, which describes the icing model, in which case, of course, there's just uh, one crossing equation. Um, so there's something very special about Q equals three relative to any other real value of Q. Um, okay, so now let's get to the actual results. So this is our first plot. So um, this is in two dimensions. And the only assumption we put into this plot is that sigma and sigma prime are the only two relevant operators, which of course we know to be true for both the critical and tri-critical POTS model. Um, for the bootstrap experts, I should note that I did this with n max equals 14. So that basically says how precise this plot is. You know, that, that's what this n max tells us. That's the number of derivatives. Um, okay, so you see there's this big allowed region. It starts roughly at you know zero zero, I guess, which would where the free theory would be if it actually existed. Um, and so there's several interesting things about this plot. So firstly, there's a very clear kink, extremely close to the known value of the tricritical theory. So you can see there's this kink. In particular, above the kink, it's concave up. Below the kink, it's concave down. So there's a very sharp discontinuity right there. Um, and I should note that you really have to put this gap above sigma and sigma prime if you wanted to see this kink. Um, another interesting fact is that this region of the plot is roughly linear, and then it kind of stops becoming linear, and where it stops becoming linear, that's where the critical POTS model lives. 
And so I, I wrote this red dotted line. This is just to guide your eye. So this red dotted line is just a line which follows the upper bound up here. And then it just continues being a line over here. And, and, and when the actual upper bound goes away from that red line, that's where this critical POTS model lives. There's a third interesting fact, which is that you see not only the critical POTS model, which is the lowest member of this W3 family, but you actually seem to see every member of this W3 family. And this is something which was first pointed out by Ming Su and his collaborator in 2017. And the reason why you see these other theories is because, as I mentioned in previous slides, when you specifically look at the sigma cross sigma OPE, for every single member of this family, only two relevant Z3 operators appear. This is despite the fact that if you were to look at other OPEs, there would be more relevant charged operators. So, so, so the fact that you're seeing this entire family of W3 minimal models is something which is special to the specific full frame function we're looking at. I would expect that if we were to look at mixed correlators, eventually you would not see these other W3 minimal models in the allowed region. Um, but, but still, I think it's cool that you see them. This is very similar to something which was first pointed out, bootstrap study of Z2 invariant CFTs in two dimensions. You know, the IC model is the most famous example. And in that case, they also found some kind of upper bound where they saw all these diagonal minimal models along that bound. So I think it was first pointed out by Alessandro Vicky, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, so this is our first main result. And the main point is that we see two very clear kinks, one for the critical, one for the tricritical. So people, I think last week were discussing like, you know, is there some simple case where you see two kinks for two different theories in one plot? And the answer is yes. And uh, right here. Just a, a numerical convergence. So because this is a work in progress, uh, we're not done yet. You know, we intend to go to way higher precision. Um, and so I wanted just to show you some uh, brief results about how this is going to change. So in this plot, you see, I'm just zooming in on the region near the tri-critical kink. So this is an extremely zoomed in plot. That's why this tricritical exact value seems a little bit far away from the kink. But as you see, as we are increasing n max, which is how we parameterize the precision, you see that this plot is changing most drastically where the kink is. So the kink is moving to the right, and it's moving to exactly where we want it to go. So I think this should convince you that in the limit of infinite n max, the kink will be at exactly the tricritical point. Because um, it's, it's going in the right direction, and it is changing. Okay. So, so now that we have this nice upper bound, and now that we have evidence that the theories that we care about live on the upper bound, that means we can now look at the spectrum of all operators that appear in this four point function along the upper bound, which recall is the other thing you can do with the bootstrap. So here are our spectrum results. And I should note that I got these results this morning. <laughs> so it really is a work in progress. Uh, excuse uh, me? Yeah? So is it possible to extrapolate in this parameter n max? In your previous uh, yeah. graph, okay. So that, that that's a, a, for a example. Uh, okay, so the so the, there's a point where it moves the most, about zero point zero nine, and then the point next right to it. Supposedly, if you extrapolated it, you would see a rather big effect. So maybe this is worth studying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's so that, that that's a very good question, and indeed, this is something people do in the bootstrap. So there are many studies where people will compute, say, some kink. As a function of like many values of this n max, and then extrapolate n max code infinity. Um, uh, so that's something we might do, but you know something which is a bit more conservative is simply just to go to a really huge value of n max. And and I assure you, we plan on going to work for values of n max. So like you know before this project is done, I plan on doing n max equals sixty. You know like we've only been working on this for three weeks. So and so it's conceivable that if we still don't have enough precision, we might do an extrapolation. But a more conservative choice is just to go to a huge value of n max. Uh, but but the, the, thank you for the question. Uh, okay, so so here is the bootstrap spectrum in two D. So this is just um, all the this is the solution to crossing, which is on the upper bound of the plot I just showed. You. So these plots are a little bit complicated. First of all, I should note that these spectrum plots were made using the navigator function, um, which Ning introduced last week, because Ning is of course the expert in navigator functions. Okay, so let's let's go slowly with these plots. So first of all, both of these plots were made with n max ten. So that means they're slightly less precise than the upper bound plot I showed you before. And that's simply just because it's a work in progress. We haven't had time to make the NMAX 14 ones yet. Um, so this red line is just to guide your eye and just to show you where the kink would be in the upper bound plot for the tricritical plots model. Um, and so it's slightly different from the previous plot because that was NMAX 14. This black line is just to tell you where marginality is. So it just at the value 
d equals two because we're in two dimensions. So the left plot, the x-axis is the scaling dimension of delta sigma. So it's the quick V3 charged operator. And then the y-axis um, is showing various operators in the singlet sector with spin zero. And so that, that's what these various like colors are. So yellow is the lowest operator, which is a singlet of spin zero. Green is the second lowest operator. Orange is the third lowest operator, et cetera. Um, so the way these spectrum work is that the higher the you don't have a huge amount of precision, I would probably only trust maybe the lowest couple operators in the spectrum plot. Although the hope is that as we go to higher precision, you'll be able to trust more and more. Um, the plot on the right is the same spectrum. I'm just looking at the spin two operators instead of the spin zero operators. And also I zoomed in a little bit more. So the plot on the right, I'm just looking just about the tricritical value. The plot on the left was showing a larger range. So we can compare the, the spectra that we're seeing to what we expect theory. So these blue dots correspond to the exactly known tricritical IC model, and the red dots correspond to the exactly known POTS model. So let's start with this plot here. The lowest operator are these yellow dots. You should ignore the dots at the bottom. That's just like some, it's some fake effect, which is that you always see dots at uh, unitarity. So ignore the dots at the bottom. The first non-trivial dots are the yellow dots. Um, and as you see, the yellow dots are very close to the expected lowest operator for both the tricritical and critical theories. Now, something which is a little bit funny is that, of course, because our plots are not fully converged, that means the kink is not at precisely the tricritical point yet. And that's why this red dotted line is not exactly right here. But it's pretty close. And as mentioned, I think with improved precision, the red dotted line will be exactly here. And then you know these yellow dots will presumably get even closer. Something which is even nicer and which is very important for us is that not only is the lowest um, epsilon pretty accurate, but the second lowest epsilon is also pretty accurate. So like these green dots are roughly saying where this epsilon prime operator is. And you see that already, even at this low amount of precision, it's pretty close to the expected value. And so that means that once we go to higher dimension, as long as I'm using at least n max 10, I think we can trust the spectrum for the lowest two epsilons, which is very important. Um, if we look over at the POTS model, um, the lowest operator seems pretty well converged. The second lowest operator clearly is not. One question. Uh, yes. So you say the dimension of the second singlet is pretty accurate, but that's if you look where the blue dot is, but if you look where the dark that's line exactly is. That's what i Yeah, so, uh, so indeed, so for the critical POTS, it's less accurate. Um, and so I think this is just related to the fact that it's a bit harder for us to, like the tricritical kink is a very clear kink. Like you very clearly see a discontinuity in the upper bound. The kink is much less clear because, you know, I tried to point it out by just saying that, we're at what, you know, in one area of the plot, you had a line. And then after that line, it stops becoming a line. But that's not a very clear way of saying where the theory is. And so uh, because these plots are not fully converged, it could well be the case that, um, you know, the true critical plots kink is in fact to the left, to the right of this plot. So you see these green dots are going up. And so if you were to like look to the right of this plot, these green dots would be closer to this purple value. And, and then the expectation would be that as you know, Nmax increases, um, you know, the critical pots kink would move to the left and then these large green values would get closer to the purple. So, but like the bottom line is just that um, we have a good way of saying where the tricritical is and that matches the expectation. We do not have as good a way of saying where the critical is. And indeed the critical, is worse. So you should focus more on the tricritical so far. No, I was actually worried about the tricritical one because based on the numerics, the kinks is where the dashed vertical line is. You know, yeah, yeah. But as I just mentioned, um, I mean, first of all, it's pretty close. I mean, like this is a pretty zoomed in plot. Like, like the yeah, kinks it's, it's are... pretty close, but the dimension is very off. It's around one. Well, it should be 1.5. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but like, yeah. So the idea is that, um, you know, it's a work in progress. We're, we're increasing the precision. But I think there is some confidence that, like, I mean, you can clearly see the trend here, which is that after the kink, you know, this value is going to go way higher. Um, and so I think, you know, at least my expectation is that as n max uh, will increase, um, the, the red dotted line will be exactly the expected point, and we will see the second operator in the right place. But I, I agree that, you know, obviously we don't see that yet because we don't have enough precision. Um, at the very least, you should be convinced by the lowest operator because that does seem to be in roughly the right place throughout. Um, so one other fact I wanted to note is that, um, so usually when you see a kink that corresponds to some rearrangement of operators in the spectrum, 
And indeed, we see that in the spin two sector. So here you see that at precisely this kink to the left of it, there was uh, two operators, the lowest operator being the one you would expect, which is the stress tensor, and the second lowest operator being some fake operator you don't expect. And then at precisely this kink, the second operator goes away. And so you know, this might actually address the previous question. So like, you could ask the question of like, okay, we have this approach, we have the spectrum, should we trust the spectrum a little bit to the left of the kink or a little bit to the right of the kink? I'll probably, you might not know, but then this plot on the right tells you that clearly you should be looking to the right of the kink because to the right of the kink is where you don't have this fake yellow operator. And similarly on the plot on the left, it is a little bit to the right of the kink that the second lowest epsilon prime is, is reaching its expected value. Um, okay, so, um, so any other questions about these plots before I move on? Okay, great. Um, so, so now I'm gonna look at another sector. So this is also in two dimensions. This is the science uh, sector, the O minus. So in this case, at the kink, you also see some operator rearrangement. So there was like two operators to the left and just one operator to the right, which is what you expect because there shouldn't be two operators very close to each other. So, um, so that's just like another sign of like what this kink means. Um, here, I put the exact values for the tricritical and the critical. And very nicely, they both seem very close to the spectrum that we are in fact seeing. Um, and so this is more evidence that our identification of the physical theories as saturating the bound is well motivated because we get pretty good matches, certainly for the lowest operator in every sector. So like, you know, I agree that for the second lowest operator, you know, our convergence isn't good enough yet. You know, that might change, who knows, we'll get better. But certainly for the lowest operator, I think everyone should be convinced based on these plots that we're, we're seeing the physical theory because it's in almost exactly the right location. Um, okay, so, uh, so this concludes the discussion in two dimensions. And so the takeaway message you should get from our analysis in two dimensions is that we were able to see both the critical and tri-critical POTS model. So in particular, we're able to see kinks for both theories. And when we look at the spectrum at the level of precision we have so far, the spectrum matches the expected spectrum. Um, and so that means, you know, if all we care about was two dimensions, you could say it was like a, a, a big success so far. Okay, so, but now we're, what we're really interested in is above two dimensions. So now let's extend our bootstrap study to fractional D. And let me make some comments about that. So firstly, how do we go to fraction? Our bootstrap changes in two ways as we go to D bigger than two. First of all, remember, we're just using the global conformal symmetry and global conformal blocks. So we were never using Verasora symmetry. We were never using Verasora blocks. And that's why, from that perspective, it's easy to go above 2D because these global conformal blocks are known as smooth functions in terms of D. You know, it's by Dolan and Osborne in 2003. So, 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 so that's very straightforward. Um, and then the, uh, the only other input we put into this bootstrap study was the global symmetry, which of course is the same. And then we put a gap saying that there was only two relevant operators. And so that means of course, as D changes away from two, now we put the gap to D instead of two. So the point is that there's a very natural way of extending our bootstrap study from 2D to any D, which I think is one of the advantages of the bootstrap perspective. Because in the previous methods of uh, um, predicting the upper critical dimension, which I mentioned in the beginning of this, usually you would have to define these models, which were extremely different in fractional D relative to an integer D. And so that's why you couldn't necessarily be sure that your results had any relation to the box model. Whereas in the bootstrap perspective, the way you go from D equals two to D equal 2.1 is completely natural because you're just using the exact same global symmetry and the exact same assumption. Um, okay, so now one problem though with going to fractional dimensions with the bootstrap is that some CFTs in fractional dimensions have operators at very large value of delta that violate unitarity. So as far as I know, the only case where this was shown was the icing model in this paper by Slava in 2016, where they, um, and on the other hand though, even though they show that the icing model in fractional D you know, slightly broke unitarity, the contribution of high dimension operators is highly suppressed in the conformal block expansion. So it's actually very hard to see this lack of unitarity from the numerical bootstrap, which is why the results from the numerical bootstrap match the epsilon expansion in fractional dimensions, and in fact, interpolate very nicely between the results and in integer dimension. So the point is that the numerical bootstrap, even for the icing model, where you know that's in some sense non-unitary, seem to work completely fine. And like, no one really knows why, but like some motivation of why that's the case is just because the lack of unitarity is probably extremely small and the numerics aren't sensitive to it. Um, 
And so that's why I think uh, we are justified in doing numerical bootstrap in fractional dimensions. I mean, first of all, we don't even know if the POTS model does break unitarity in fractional dimensions, because I don't think anyone's ever checked. But even if it did break unitarity, my expectation is that it'd be similar to the icing model in that it would be an extremely small effect, which you wouldn't be able to notice, you know, unless you went to like n max equals like a thousand. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Isn't, isn't Slava's work with Damon essentially showing that all fractional D CFTs break? Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure Slava's work with Damon was about O-N global symmetry. It had nothing to do with space-time symmetry. So, oh, okay. Yeah. I guess I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, we can discuss this during the discussion, but uh, I think uh, it's the assumption is safe, so we can go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so, so, so now let's show the analogous upper bound plots that I showed you in 2D, now for D bigger than D. Um, and I should note that this was done with slightly less precision uh, because I only have three weeks to do this. Um, so, so here's the plot in 2.1, here's the plot in D equals 2.2, and you see these are qualitatively very similar to the plots I showed before. Um, except, of course, I'm just on a certain region. So like I, I'm not original plot, like the full plot. So there was also some kind of lower bound. Here I'm just focusing on an upper bound and I'm just focusing. But relatively similar in the sense that you still see a very clear kink where this bound goes from being concave up to concave down, which is what I call the tricritical kink. And you also seem to see another very clear feature, which is that for sufficiently large delta sigma, it's like a straight line and then it stops being a straight line. And where it stops being a straight line is what we call the, the critical plots. Um, and so for d equals 2.1 is d equals 2.2, all these plots seem very qualitatively similar. And so I would say like there's good reason to expect that both the critical and tricritical theories continue to be CFTs, at least up until d equals 2.2, at least at this level of precision. Um, one nice thing you'll notice though, is that these two kinks are getting closer to each other. So it might be because the x-axis are different in each plot, but if you were to use the same x-axis, you would very clearly see that the kinks are getting closer. And this is what we want, right? Because the merger and annihilation scenario is where the two theories get closer and closer and they eventually combine. Okay, so, so now let's look at d equals 2.3 and d equals 2.4. So now the kinks are getting even closer as we expect, but now something which is happening is that the way we define the critical pots kink is becoming a little bit harder to say because now this upper bound is no longer a straight line. It's becoming a bit curvy. Um, and so I would just say like, you know, in general, um, the tricritical kink is the one which we can very clearly identify. And the critical, it's a bit harder, you know, like the critical, you can argue about it. You could say, who knows where it is. But, but, but certainly the, the tricritical kink, it's very clear where it is in all these plots so far. So, Sorry, Shai. Yeah. And, Antonio here. So if you plot the second derivative of this plot, isn't it clear where the... Your usual plots is? Um, no, because I mean, as you see, it's pretty smooth. Like, uh, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, I, ideally, like, I mean, if, there's a, if, like, if it wasn't smooth, it, you're right, the second derivative would change. But it's not so obvious the second derivative is changing. I mean, we did look at the second derivative, but I would say at the current level of precision, it's a little hard to say. But, you know, that, that might improve as we increase precision. Um, okay, so, so, so now we can continue looking at increasingly higher space time dimension. So here I show 2.45, 2.5, and 2.6. And so as you see in these plots, both kinks are just completely disappearing. So in 2.45, you can still see the chart critical kink. In 2.5, it's pretty hard to see for me. In 2.6, I don't think you see it at all, basically. Um, and, and so I, um, you know, at a very qualitative level, of course, you're basically seeing that these two kinks became extremely close and they both disappeared. And so this is one piece of evidence for why I argue that the merger and annihilation scenario happens at around 2.5. Of course, this is very approximate because uh, we've only been doing this for a couple of weeks. We want to go to way, way higher in max, look at way more values of D, but I think we can already see qualitatively the story of what's happening. Um, but we can do even better than this. So, so far I've just shown you a plot and I'm just looking at kinks. It seemed like a very kind of qualitative uh, way of saying where a theory is. What's much more convincing is to look at the spectrum because in particular of merger and annihilation, is that when you look at the spectrum, there should be a singlet operator exactly at marginality, because that's what happens when the critical becomes the tricritical. So, so that's a much better way to merge and annihilation. So now let's look at the bootstrap spectrum in fractional dimension. So um, here we look at 2.3, and we're looking at the singlet sector. So you should uh, imagine the plots I showed you before in 2D for comparison. So on the right, um, just like in 2D, you see that there's like this fake yellow operator which disappears at the kink. 
And so this is a very clear way of seeing of why the kink is happening. Because again, there's a fake operator that's disappearing. Um, and then on, on the left-hand plot, um, this is the lowest scalar uh, singlet operator. And so it's the yellow operator, which is the one if we want to see how close it is to marginality. And you see it's getting pretty close to marginality at 2.3. So this black dotted line shows marginality. The red dotted line shows where the kink is. And this yellow is the second lowest singlet. Um, so um, we haven't had enough time to make these spectrum plots in many dimensions. So uh, all we have is 2.6. 2 is where we don't expect to see the critical or tricritical theory. And indeed, the spectrum in 2.6 is completely different from lower dimensions. So in particular, we no longer see any disappearance of fake operators because you know these yellow and blue dots exist everywhere. And we no longer see any operator even remotely close to marginality. Um, and so I think it's clear that in 2.6, just the critical and tricritical don't exist. It's clear that they do exist in 2.3. And it's also clear that the second lowest operator is getting closer and closer to marginality. So like, I think it's quite reasonable to expect that as we make more plots in between 2.3 and 2.6, we will see an operator at the kink exactly at marginality, which will be the sharpest evidence for merger and annihilation. So like much sharper than just kind of like pointing at kinks and like saying how close they are. Um, okay. So all the analysis I've done so far was with just a single correlator of sigma. And so you could ask like, uh, what about looking at other correlators? Um, so if you just wanna use the sigma single correlator, which is the simplest one, then you could also plot sigma versus epsilon instead of sigma versus sigma prime. And the advantage of doing that is that now you can put a gap in the singlet sector. So for instance, for the critical POTS model, we expect just a single relevant singlet. And so by plotting sigma versus epsilon, we, we could put a gap which imposes that there's only a single relevant thing. I tried this and it just gives a really big allowed region. And so you don't find anything interesting. This is very similar to the 2D icing model. Called, this is very similar to the 2D icing model numerical bootstrap, where if you bootstrap the, the 2D icing model, and if you only put in physical assumption of how many relevant operators there are, you get garbage results. And so like the only way to get nice results in the 2D icing model is to put in these basically unphysical assumptions of putting in huge gaps. No, no, no. But I'm sorry, Shai. Uh, could you be a bit more precise? Why not in this Because in 2D Ising model with these assumptions, you get you do get a kink in 2D. Sure, yeah, but you don't get an island. You don't get an island. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So, oh, yeah. so you do get a kink, but you don't get an island. And the only way to get an island is to put in these huge gaps. And, but and, and how that's about pots? Do you get a kink or not? No, we 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 don't get any. Okay. We we just get a bit bigger algorithm. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. So so it's it's even worse than the 2D model. Um. So uh. Now, something which we haven't done yet due to lack of time is that we could do a 3D plot. So three parameters, sigma, sigma prime, and epsilon. So this would, and then we could put gaps on both, on both sectors. This would apply to the critical plots, or we could even do a four parameter plot with sigma, sigma prime, epsilon, and epsilon prime. And we can see if plotting all these parameters, maybe it makes the kink sharper. Maybe you see a kink also in epsilon space. Um, so this is something we haven't tried just because it takes a long time. But I mean, certainly with an aggregator function, and with you know a couple more months, you know we will explore this and see if we get anything interesting. Now I should note that this is all just with a single correlator, because like one of the nice things about the POTS model is that sigma shows up in its own correlator. This is unlike the icing model, where if you looked at the correlator of sigma, you wouldn't be able to probe sigma because it doesn't show up in its own OP. So so that's kind of a nice city of the POTS model. Um, and so going beyond just the single correlator of sigma, we can also look at mixed correlators of sigma, sigma prime, and epsilon with gaps in both sectors. So this is something we actually briefly tried like roughly a year ago and we didn't find island. So, that, so that, that, that's what was pretty disappointing. This is also kind of roughly what I tried seven years ago. And like, that's why I kind of stopped working on this for so many years is that the original goal was to find islands and we just couldn't find islands by imposing all physical assumptions, even looking at tons of mixed correlates. Um, so I don't know why that is because like in general, like whether or not you find an island, you kind of have to get lucky to some extent. Um, now I should note that I think you can always find an island if you start putting like random assumptions. So if you start gaps in like, you know, spin two sectors, spin one sector, if you start putting gaps above, you know, um, uh, D, you'll always find some kind of island. But I, I'm personally, I'm not very convinced by such islands because the assumptions you're putting in are not physical. The only physical assumptions are the number of relevant operators. And especially once I start going beyond D equals two, I have no idea what the assumptions are aside from the number of relevant operators. And that's why I think it's very dangerous to start putting all kinds of unjustified gaps. And, and so I, I don't plan on doing it. Um, on the other hand, though, um, even though you don't see islands by looking at these mixed correlators, it's still quite possible that doing mixed correlators would make our kinks much sharper. 
And so that is certainly something we plan on doing and investigating whether or not it will improve our kinks and, and our spectrum for that matter. So um, for instance, the simplest mixed correlator you can look at is where you do mixed correlators or segments of the prime. This is the simplest case because it's just 15 crossing equations compared to three in our single correlator study. And there's just two parameters to plot, sigma and sigma prime. So that makes it a bit more feasible than having to plot sigma and sigma prime and epsilon. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, yeah. Could, could you back, go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. Well, no, 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 that one. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, what did you do for the mixed correlators? You used all correlators for sigma, sigma prime, and epsilon. And did you also scan over the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we scan oh, the over angles? So, the, the, the usual thing, yeah. You, you scanned over all the OPE angles? And yeah, you yeah, the, yeah, 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 any? yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so, um, so our conclusions is that we have found a sharp kink that matches the known tricritical POTS model in 2D. So that's one of our main results. Uh, we found a slightly less sharp feature at the expected critical POTS model in 2D. I should note that this feature was previously observed by uh, Rong and Sue in their paper from 2017. This feature is less sharp because it's where the straight line um, you know, becomes a non-straight line, which is a bit, uh, it's not as sharp as just seeing an actual thing. Um, also like an interesting fact, also pointed out by Rong and Sue in their previous paper, is that these W3 minimal models um, all appear on the upper bound of uh, the R plot. Um, we then extracted the spectrum in two dimensions, and we saw that the spectrum matched the known exact spectrum for the critical and tricritical theories, certainly for the lowest operators in each sector. And for the second lowest operators, I think we need a bit more convergence in order to get a nice match. Um, we then looked above 2D, and we saw that the kinks got closer and closer until they eventually disappeared at around D equals 2.5, at which point we also had some evidence that epsilon prime is becoming marginal. Um, so this is evidence for the merger and annihilation scenario. Of course, we need way more precision and we need to look at way more data. points. So, because this is just a work in progress. But, but I hope that from what I've shown you so far, I, I think it's quite reasonable this is what we're gonna see. Because we already see them getting closer and we already see the operator getting closer and closer to marginality. So for future directions, well, because it's a work in progress, of course, there's many future directions. Um, I mean, we want to you know, improve the kinks in the spectrum by increasing numerical precision and looking at more correlators. Something I didn't talk about at all is that usually in the bootstrap, people like to look at the value of the central charge, CT, which above two dimensions is defined as just the coefficient of the function of the stress tensor. So in, in other cases like the icing model, it was found that the CT showed a minimum at the icing model in the space of all possible Z2 theories. So it'd be interesting if uh, CT also shows a minimum for the POTS model. Now I can say based on some plots I made seven years ago that I think it does. Um, but uh, I haven't looked into that in seven years. So <laughs> I need to look into that again. Um, now, uh, an interesting um, comment, which was pointed out actually by Kai to me last week, is that it would be interesting to look at the upper critical dimension as a function of real Q between two and four. Um, so not just Q equals three, which is what I've discussed so far, but generalizing the story. Um, and so I think this should be possible because after all, we do have the crossing equations as a function of real Q. Um, that this is what was worked out by Rong and Sue in their paper. So remember, there's four crossing equations for generic real Q. And so the hope is that, if, you know, by imposing all the physical gaps and using these, these crossing equations as a function of Q, you would also find kinks corresponding to the critical and tricritical theories, and you could do the exact same story. And so what would be very nice about doing this is that those estimates, which I gave in the beginning of the talk, um, like they were all, like these were estimates from other methods of where the upper critical dimension is, and they were always looking at some like very specific value. So like they were saying like, say D equals 2.5, my estimate for Q is like 2.6 or something like that. And so it's very hard to compare those estimates to my current results because none of those estimates were for exactly Q equals three. Like instead what they would do is that they would fix D and they would find the critical value of Q. But if I could do a bootstrap study for arbitrary D and Q, then I could very directly compare it to these previous studies and see if their estimates match the bootstrap result, which I think would be very nice. Um, okay, so I, I think uh, uh, that's it. Okay, well, uh, thanks a lot, Shai. Let's thank Shai for his excellent talk. So uh, I can, uh, I can, uh, uh, yeah, the audience. people should ask questions. There are some questions on the chat. Uh, but maybe first, let's, let's ask people to just speak up.
For example, Raul oh. has a question. Raul, can you just speak up and ask your question? Oh, oh okay. Oh, oh, okay. So I, I think I can just repeat the question. So just yeah, sure, please do. So if the audience has a question, ask it, and then I'll repeat it. Uh, okay. So uh, um, the question was for real Q, you don't have unitarity, so can you use the same method? So can you use the same method? So this is, this is a, a very good question. Um, and so I mean, you, in some sense, you could ask the same question about real D. You know, because like once you start going to fractional D, in some sense, unitarity is also broken. So Slava is probably the expert in this regard. The question would be like. Is unitarity broken worse by going to real Q versus going to real D? And so you could ask maybe in the context of the ON model, like is unitarity broken worse by going to real N or by going to fractional D? So, um, I mean, I, I saw that would probably be the best one to answer this question. Um, yeah, well, I, I think uh, one has to study a bit more carefully what happens, for example, with dimensions with various representations as a function of q and my hunch would be that if if some of these representations that play the role in uh, in your study shy if some of them for certain q have become of negative dimension then i would be really worried about unitarity being severely broken but if everyone has a positive but non-integer dimensions i mean dimension of the representation then maybe I would be more comfortable with using this uh, numerical technique. Yeah, so, 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 Salva, so in your, in your paper where you were looking at specifically two dimensions, you, 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 know, you have like exact results for all real Q. And indeed, I think you found that the uh, scaling dimensions of like at least the low lying operators were all real and they all had kind of like reasonable values, right? You know, at least between Q equals two and four. Yeah, so between Q equals two and four, this uh, CFTs, they, um, all the scaling dimensions are of, of primaries are real or of coefficients are real. Of course, uh, we know that that uh, that these primaries, even though they have a real dimension, we know since the center of charge is uh, less than one, and we know that the dimension. Uh, we, we know that somewhere there is some descendant which has a negative norm. We know, uh, but I mean, there's some quasi-primary uh, Verasori descendant which has a negative norm. But uh, yeah, but again, one has to see where exactly this negative norm descendant sits, and probably uh, this negative norm descendant is buried among many positive norm states. So, so the situation is not very uh, different from. I think the same argument that uh, kind of intuitive argument that explains why for the easing model in an integer D, this numerical technique might be reliable. It also works for, it could also be applied for a non-integer Q. So I would try, I would, I would, uh, I would try and see. Yeah. So, I mean, I can say actually this past week, I did try a little bit. And so this is for real Q and I tried plotting sigma versus sigma prime. So far, I just got a really big allowed region. I didn't find anything interesting so far. Uh, but of course, there's many things to try. I mean, because like, I mean, the most notable difference between Q equals three and, and real Q is that there's an extra representation that shows up in this specific correlator of sigma. Because like once you're looking at the tensor product of two fundamentals of SQ, there are now four representations um, instead of just three, as in the case of Q equals three. And so it, it might be the case To sigma prime, but perhaps sigma versus the lowest relevant operator in this new representation. And like, and like, I mean, maybe that's the thing, you know, that shows the nice kink for general Q. And then and when Q equals three, then it becomes like the, the story you already saw. I mean, there, there's, there's just certainly a lot to explore. Hmm. Yeah, because also, also in real Q, you know, we can match all these results, you know, worked out by people, you know, I guess here in Paris. I guess you guys have computed all kinds of things for real Q, OP coefficients, and scaling dimensions, and in principle, you know, all of numerical bootstrap. Just a, a small comment. So in the beginning, you gave a lot of different, you, you outlined a lot of different techniques to determine these points in D comma Q plane. Yeah. It would maybe be nice to have some kind of figure just showing where they all are, where is your estimate, and see how, what what agrees and what is precise and so on. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, 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 like, that's something I, I briefly touched upon, which is that unfortunately, it's very hard to compare my results to their results. People will compute things for the most part. Well, what Q critical is is a function of D. And so, they, and so, like, whereas what I'm doing is in some sense the opposite, where I'm fixing the value of Q and then I'm asking for the critical value of D. And so, none of those previous studies, as far as I know, were kind of directly looking at Q equals three. Because like they would they would for instance say like you know let's um, like fix d to be like two point three and let's find what okay right I, I realized that yeah. but uh, still we would expect that there would be some simply some critical line or critical yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. GQ plane that would uh, be nice and smooth somehow and interpolate between uh, easing in four d and four state pots in two d. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so like, so like, th th that would be the motivation for extending this bootstrap to real Q, because then you could really make a very precise comparison. Um, if we only have results for Q equals three, I agree. Even still, it will eventually be nice to compare the two. I think our, our research project is at too early a stage to make such a comparison. All I can say so far is that, roughly speaking, we're seeing merger and annihilation at around two point five, but th that could very well change. I mean, like. You know, we plan on like you know quintupling the amount of precision over the next few months, and so like it could well be the case that precision way 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 higher. We now find merger and annihilation at around you know d equals two point three, which would be closer to these previous. So so like that's why I didn't want to make any claims so far because I think it's just too early. But but I completely agree with you that this is something we should do and we plan on doing. Okay. The, the epsilon nice. expansion gives a straight line, but that's only a leading order in epsilon. It would be nice to have more orders in epsilon in that calculation. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so Amman brings up an important point, which is that, so his study would in principle apply to our case, because it's an epsilon expansion, and you could just simply plug in whatever value of epsilon that corresponds to Q equals three. Um, I guess like your study would predict merger and annihilation very close to three, but it could be that I was an epsilon could, could uh, you know, I, I noticed that there's actually a, a paper which came out a couple of years after yours. Um, I guess I can go back by, by Newman at all. Um, okay, let me go back to the beginning. Um, uh, yeah, so, so there was another epsilon expansion paper which came out after Amnon's paper in 83 by Newman, Riedel, and Muto. Um, and I, I think giving slightly different results, like, um, I mean, I, I didn't, I, but. Um, I don't remember that, I'll need to look at it. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, because like, I think they were arguing that like, maybe there was like some other effects you had to take into account in the epsilon expansion. Um, yeah, but yeah, but I, I, I think, you know, it would, it would be great if there could be an epsilon expansion to many orders. You know, we could try to directly compare that to, uh, to, to our results. So why is the epsilon expansion only done to one loop? I mean, the diagrams are calculated up to six loop. And... Because I left that problem at that time. But as far as I remember, that uh, that uh, paper of New Madrid and Muta, I remember seeing it, and it's not. Um, as far as I remember, it's not a, a weakly coupled calculation, meaning that you have to make some assumptions about. Uh, you can actually you cannot actually go to an arbitrary high order in that in that uh, theory that they set up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's an ERG calculation. Q. Somehow. Even though you would think, ah, well, the theory is Gaussian, but in fact, the way this departure from Q equal two D equal four happens in, in in their scenario is that you couple a Gaussian sector to some non-Gaussian sector uh, and you see uh, to arrange the RG flow. And so you do have to set up some sort of functional RG. I think that's what they do. I don't know. And I don't know uh, Abman's paper there. You can do another expansion on three dimensions and Q equals three, I think. Yeah. Can I ask a question, Shai? So you, you said that uh, in... Um, Ah, yeah. Uh, somebody's pointing out that uh, that uh, uh, that Hugh Osborne wanted to ask a question for a while. Hugh, could you go ahead? Yeah. Well, it's only very probably a premature question that if you take the scaling dimensions of the two operators which merge at d critical, can you fit their variation to some curve as a function of d minus d critical, perhaps involving a square root, or perhaps you don't have enough data yet? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think that would be an interesting thing to do once we have, uh, well, more data and more precision. Uh, Any other questions? Sorry, a very basic question. Um, is there an RG flow from these three critical pods to the critical pods, just like in this in case, or? Is there an RG flow? Um, well, I, well, I don't really even know what Lagrangian would use to, des to describe the two. Uh, so um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I'm sure there must be people in the audience who have probably studied this question before. I mean, you can definitely consider it. I mean, suppose that you you are doing a super duper precision study and you extract like the spectrum uh, near the annihilation point, both for critical and to critical NOP coefficients. Then you can uh, check whether that spectrum extraction is consistent with the conformal perturbation theory. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. Um, yeah, so hopefully if we get enough precision, I guess one could start theory. I guess this would be kind of analogous to the paper by David and Sohar, where they were like doing conformal perturbation theory around like the 2D icing model and the 3D icing model. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but in that case, you know, they were using the fact that you had a completely solved theory and an extremely numerically solved theory in 3D. We are at a very early stage in our in our uh, analysis. Any other questions? So I see there's actually an interesting comment by Miguel, which I can barely see where he was saying that it could be that the two theories could merge and move into the allowed region. Um, and so I, I think it's an, an important thing to you know, possibly worry about is that because, because we don't have islands. So like, you know, the thing you want in the bootstrap is islands. Because with an island, you know exactly what the theory is. You know, as Saba said last week, in some sense, these kinks are like the ice age because like you have to kind of like assume that the theory is on the upper bound and how do you know it's on the upper bound? Maybe it's like somewhere in the allowed region. And so like, I think that we have some evidence that it is on the upper bound because after all in two dimensions, we saw that the exact values are on the upper bound and the spectrum seems to match. But you could always be a skeptic and you could say like, okay, maybe in 2D it's on the upper bound, but like maybe above 2D, like the true theory becomes into the allowed region and then you just have no way of accessing it. And so indeed that is possible. And like without islands, there's no way we could uh, avoid that. Um, and so, um, yeah, so like I think that's uh, certainly a caveat. To worry about. Uh, can you say so? You you said uh, you, you kind of spoke out forcefully against assuming some gaps. <laughs> yeah. But then you, uh, but then in in your own plots you said that you did have to assume some gaps. So can you say which gaps you assume? No, no, no. But the thing is, the only gap I'm assuming is the number of relevant operators. That's what I meant. No, no. You said you have to assume some gaps to see the king. No, no, yeah, but by that gap, I meant that? just the number of relevant operators. That's all I meant. So I just meant like the, the simplest gap, which is simply that in the charge sector, you put a gap at D and you insert two operators below. That's what I meant by gap. But like that's just the exact same thing as saying how many relevant operators there are. I didn't put any additional gap. So, so you assume that there is sigma, sigma is the external guy. Just, uh, let me just phrase how I see it yeah. and you correct me. So sigma is the external guy and yeah. you assume that the NP of sigma, okay, of course you put the sigma where it should be. And then you assume that there is at most one sigma prime which you scan over. Yes. And everyone else in this channel is irrelevant. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So how about uh, epsilon and epsilon prime? Do you also assume that there is all, only two, or no. you cannot assume it easily? No, I, I haven't done that yet because um, there would just be a larger space, space space to scan over. I mean, that's yeah. something we plan on doing. So, like in like the future directions I mentioned, that it'd be nice to like you know scan over epsilon epsilon prime, um, and you know impose you know that those are the only two relevant operators, and like that would possibly you know. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I can say that like we briefly attempted to get islands using that idea of, of like scanning over sigma, sigma prime, and epsilon for the critical pots and assuming epsilon was the only relevant singlet. We could not find an island in such a way. Um, nonetheless, it could be that we find a very nice thing. And that's something we haven't explored carefully yet. I mean, this is something where the navigator function will really be very useful. Additional bootstrap would be extremely hard to scan over four parameters with like who knows how many crossing equations to very high precision. But with the navigator function, it becomes more reasonable. But are you willing to assume, for example, one natural thing, which would be spectrum continuity in D? Um, are you, okay, so yeah. So I think what you're saying is that like you could look at the spectrum in 2D and like that could maybe motivate some gaps, which um, aren't just saying how many relevant operators there are, but nonetheless are well motivated by the spectrum and could possibly give you islands. Yeah, so indeed, um, I mean, uh, that's something we are considering doing. 
I, I'm so cautious about doing that because like the moment you start making these assumptions, it's like, you're not hundred percent sure if they're correct above 2D. And like, you know, like, uh, like you, can the law, the law, you can always test them for self-consistency because whichever island you get or whichever bound you get, you can extract the spectrum and see if there is any operator at the gap. If there is an operator at the gap, then it's garbage. If you get, if you assume some gap, or you extract the spectrum and there's no one at the gap, then, then it means that you you can trust this. Sure, sure, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah. So like, I, I, I think me in particular has been advocating for doing this, and I, I'm, I, we will do it. Uh, um, okay. yeah. yeah, I, it just, I'm just showing you, I guess, the, the absolute most conservative thing you could do is what we've done so far. But it's no more conservative because, because yeah, I, yeah, okay. Well, anyway, it's uh, you guys are doing a great job. Uh, as, are there any other questions? If there are no questions, I just want to wanted to comment that okay, in the past, I think there were many like people who tried to see collision of kings and so on, and it it it. Uh, I I think this study that. Uh, Shai Chester presented, at least in my personal opinion, it's like the most convincing demonstration of collision of kinks that they, because these are real kinks and it's not just some rounded off kinks. It's really, it's looking great. So I think we are looking forward to how this work in progress is going to play out. And yeah, thank and you. You know, I actually just want, want to make one last comment, which is that in some sense, the work I showed you today was inspired by this conference. Because you know, I mentioned I've been like working on and off on this thing for seven years, but I had mostly been off in the last couple of years. And then Prof asked me to give a talk about this, and then all of these results were after he asked me to give the talk. So in the last month, uh, so <laughs> it's because of this conference that we've had these results. Fantastic. Okay, uh, Shai, since you are the co-host, uh, okay, we we thank Shai again, and then Shai, you just turn off the recording, and that's uh, thanks.